Dear colleagues, welcome to the fourth annual Alert Colloquium presented by the Alert Network and our esteemed partners at the American Society for Radiation Oncology, the European Society of Surgical Oncology, the European Society of Gynecological Oncology, MASC, the International Association of Supportive Care and Cancer, SIOG, the International Society for Geriatric Oncology, and Oncoalert Consortium, which is made up of 12 medical oncology societies from low and middle income countries. Together, we bring you this end of the year review for 2023 in oncology. My name is Allison Betzoff Warner. I am the director of the Melanoma Program at Stanford University School of Medicine and a proud member of the OncoAlert Network. Really thrilled to be back with you this year to give you 2023 melanoma updates. Lots to talk about this year, so we're going to dive right in. So we will start by covering adjuvant therapy updates in both the stage two and stage three setting, then ed move on to advanced disease, uveal melanoma what's coming up around the horizon, and wrap it all up. All right, to start with stage two melanoma with adjuvant therapy to reduce the risk of, re of recurrence, we saw updates in two major trials this year, Checkmate 76K with nivolumab and Keynote 716 with uh, pembrolizumab. So as a brief reminder, recurrence rates for stage two melanoma are 24% for stage 2A, 35% for stage 2B, and 43% for stage 2C. And that stage 2C recurrence rate is actually even higher than stage 3A, where we do have approvals previously for uh, single agent PD-1 uh, to reduce the risk of recurrence. And that is what prompted people to investigate uh, these agents for prevention of recurrence or risk reduction in stage two melanoma. So updates to Checkmate 76K were presented by Dr. Georgina Long at ASCO this year. As a brief reminder, this is a trial of resected stage 2B and 2C melanoma uh, with standard wide local excision and a negative sentinel lymph node biopsy. There were 790 patients randomized two to one to nivolumab versus placebo for 12 months with a primary endpoint of recurrence-free survival. At this update, we saw the recurrence-free survival at the 12-month mark um, of 89% versus 79% for the placebo arm, the median recurrence-free survival is not yet reached in the Nevo arm or the placebo arm. The hazard ratio for risk of recurrence is 0.42, and that is statistically significant. Um, additionally, Dr. Long looked at multiple biomarkers and showed that benefit was preserved over placebo, regardless of many biomarkers and independent of BRAF mutation status. So at this time, biomarkers don't look like they, they can help us to drive the decision about who should be getting adjuvant therapy for stage two disease. Additionally, we saw Dr. Jason Luke present updates to the Keynote 716 trial, very similar design, uh, stage 2B or 2C resected melanoma with a negative sentinel lymph node biopsy, no evidence of regional or distant metastasis at the time of enrollment. Patients were randomized one-to-one -one in this trial to either uh, pembrolizumab every three weeks or placebo uh, for a total of a year. Again, recurrence-free survival as the primary endpoint and distant metastasis-free survival as a secondary endpoint. Here we saw a 36-month update. The median follow-up here was 39.4 months. For the recurrence-free survival, we saw a 36-month recurrence-free survival of 76.2% for pembrolizumab versus 63.4% for placebo with a hazard ratio of 0.62, which is statistically significant. And for distant metastasis, free survival, a hazard ratio of 0 0.59. Again, statistically significant. Um, and uh, about a 10% uh, reduction in distant metastasis, free survival at that 36 month time point. Uh, toxicity here is fairly standard for pembrolizumab. 
17.2% of patients had grade three or grade four uh, adverse treatment related adverse events versus 5.1% in the placebo arm. Uh, approximately 16% of those patients had, uh, had treatment discontinuation due to a treatment related adverse event versus only 2.5% in the placebo arm. Uh, no deaths due to treatment in this trial. Okay, we're going to sum this all up at the end, um, but we're going to move on in the interest of time to the stage three setting. So adjuvant therapy for stage three resected melanoma. And this trial really made a splash this year. This was the Keynote 942 trial um, that looked at a personalized neoantigen mRNA vaccine plus pembrolizumab uh, in stage three disease. So this vaccine, V940, is an individualized neoantigen vaccine prepared from a patient's tumor at the time of resection, uh, designed to encode up to 34 neoantigens specific to a patient's tumor, with the idea here of triggering a endogenous neoantigen T cell response, as well as to trigger uh, epitope spreading to novel antigens with the ability to improve upon the response to anti-PD-1 therapy. The trial design here, this looked at resected stage 3B, stage 3C, stage 3D, or stage 4 cutaneous melanoma that was completely resected within 13 weeks prior to the first dose of pembrolizumab. Patients needed to be disease-free at study entry and were randomized two to one to uh, vaccine plus pembrolizumab versus pembrolizumab alone for a total of one year, the primary endpoint of recurrence-free survival, and a secondary endpoint of distant metastasis-free survival. The recurrence-free survival data made the first splash from this trial at AACR presented by Dr. Jeff Weber um, with an 18-month recurrence-free survival of 78.6 months in the Pembro plus vaccine arm versus 62.2 months in the Pembro alone arm for a hazard ratio of 0.56 and a p-value of uh, 0.02. Uh, at ASCO this year, Dr. Adnan Kitzhak updated these data with the distant metastasis-free data, a free survival, um, at 18 months, which was 91% in the Pembro plus vaccine arm versus 76.8% in the uh, Pembro alone arm with the hazard ratio of 0.35. Um, and that also was statistically significant and quite impressive. Shown here on the right um, is this displayed a different way. Um, so in the dark blue are the local regional recurrences uh, versus the distant recurrences in the lighter blue color. And you can see um, much less distant recurrence in the patients treated with vaccine plus pembrolizumab. Um, adverse events here. So certainly um, there were some adverse events related to the vaccine, but these were typical vaccine type reactions, fatigue, injection site pain, fevers, chills, um, headaches, myalgias. Very few of these were grade three uh, or above. And um, really most of the toxicity here in this trial was quite consistent with what we see uh, for pembrolizumab. Very little added toxicity other than transient vaccine-related effects. All right, let's move on to advanced disease. So at ASCO this year, Dr. Hussein Taubi gave us the two-year data from Relativity 047. This was the double-blind phase two, three study uh, in frontline treatment, previously untreated, unresectable, or metastatic melanoma. Patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to the fixed-dose combination of nivolumab plus relatlimab versus nivolumab alone with a primary endpoint here of progression-free survival and secondary endpoints of overall survival and objective response rate. The progression-free survival data uh, were updated and are shown here on the left. The median progression-free survival was 10.2 months for Nevo plus relatlimab uh, versus 4.6 months for nivolumab alone with a hazard ratio of 0.81. Um, and that was statistically significant. Um, median overall survival not yet reached in the Nevo plus Rella arm, 
um, and 33 months in the NEVO alone arm. That hazard ratio, uh, the confidence interval does cross one and is not statistically significant, but the curves are shown here and there is some separation of those curves. Importantly, we saw the objective response rate uh, presented in this update. Um, and you can see that is 44% for nivolumab plus relatlimab versus 34% uh, for nivolumab, so about a 9.8% percent uh, objective response rate difference between these groups. Um, median duration of response not yet reached in either arm. Um, but notably, the key difference in objective response rate shown here in purple, uh, the complete response rate is essentially identical in the groups, um, but about 10% more partial responses in the nivolumab plus relatlimab arm. Um, Additionally, we saw progression-free survival two data presented, and this was really important. Um, as many of you are aware, there were a series of cases published in the New England Journal of Medicine as a letter um, suggesting really poor responses to ipilimumab-based therapy for patients who progressed after nivolumab plus relatlimab, and that raised uh, questions about the use of this agent in the front line. Um, here, Dr. Tauby updated us with progression-free survival two. So essentially, what is that time to progression after two lines of therapy? And the median PFS2 in the nivolumab plus relatlimab arm uh, was 28.4 months versus 20.1 months in the nivolumab arm for a hazard ratio of 0.79 that was statistically significant. So that benefit from Nevo plus Rella continues to benefit the patients even after their second line of therapy. Additionally, these numbers are quite small. Uh, 16 patients in the Nevo plus Rella arm treated with nivolumab plus ipilimumab. Um, four of those patients did respond uh, so about a quarter of those patients, which is very much in line with data that we've seen in the past uh, for patients who progressed on PD-1 alone. Um, so more to come here, and we certainly need to understand more about treatment after uh, progression on nivolumab plus relatlimab, but a reassuring update. Let's move on to uveal melanoma, where we did see some interesting improvements this year. So as many of you are aware, uveal melanoma is a very rare but highly fatal disease uh, driven primarily by metastasis to the liver. And some of the challenges at liver-directed therapy has been the inability to get therapy to really penetrate the liver when just injected uh, into the IVC. So uh, the PERIO-01 trial was presented by Dr. Sapna Patel at SITSI this year and uses a pressure-enabled drug delivery system. Um, that op is designed to optimize vascular pressure to enhance perfusion of drug into the liver. The drug here is SD101, which is a toll-like receptor 9 agonist, with the goal of depleting myeloid-derived suppressor cells uh, to allow for improved T-cell recruitment and activation. You can see that this uh, drug delivery device does improve perfusion, um, and uh, the drug uh, shown here in the bottom, um, so on the left, you can see just needle injection of the drug versus this infusion device and significantly more drug making it into the liver. This trial had three cohorts. Cohort A was SD101 as a single agent, cohort B, SD101 plus PD-1, and cohort C was SD101 plus anti-PD-1 plus anti-CTLA-4. Um, you can see the toxicity data here. Um, cohort A shows us that SD101 really does not add a lot of toxicity, very well tolerated, um, though there is a documented immune activity in the serum and the tissue. Cohort B, we see um, really that SD101 does not add significant toxicity uh, to single agent PD1, um, doesn't really increase the safety event rate. In cohort C, however, as expected, adding CTLA4 increased the risk of adverse events, um, but still not beyond what we would expect uh, typically with dual checkpoint blockade alone. Um, 
the overall safety data show that giving SD-101 directly into the liver via this infusion device really does not add significant toxicity. Um, and when we think about efficacy, granted very small patient populations in a uh, phase one dose escalation trial, but across all doses, there was a 58.58% disease control rate when given in combination with immune checkpoint blockade and an 81% disease control rate at a dose of two milligrams of SD-101 plus, uh, uh, sorry, at that uh, two milligrams of SD-101 dose when given with checkpoint blockade. You can see the best on treatment responses here uh, across the cohorts at dosing levels. So in uh, cohort B, lots of stable disease at two milligrams, um, as well as stable disease uh, plus partial responses at these higher uh, four milligrams and eight milligram doses. And then cohort C uh, was the combination with ipilimumab plus nivolumab. Uh, Additionally, in addition to these efficacy data, CTDNA data were presented by Dr. Patel, and 86% um, of patients had a reduction in CTDNA circulating out to outside of the liver, and 59% of those patients actually cleared their CTDNA, so went from CTDNA positive to CTDNA negative. All right. Um, so more to come from SD-101, that trial is expanding at the two milligram dose, and we are awaiting that expansion uh, eagerly to be able to treat more patients and really better understand the efficacy. In additional improvements in liver-directed therapy for this disease, last year, 2022, we saw the FOCUS trial, which looked at um, melphalan delivery uh, via catheter directly into the liver. Um, this looked at 144 patients, uh, 91 of whom got percutaneous hepatic infusion. The objective response rate in that group uh, we will discuss. This was presented by Dr. Jonathan Zager at ASCO in 2022. And you can see the progression-free survival arm as well, or, uh, curves as well as the overall survival curves. Um, but most importantly, really want to draw your attention to this really impressive waterfall plot in a highly resistant and difficult to treat disease. Um, so the objective response rate here was 36% with a median duration of response of 14 months and a disease control rate of 73.6%, again, in an exceptionally difficult to treat disease. As a result of that, we saw the second uh, UV, ever uveal melanoma specific FDA approval, and this was approved uh, in um, August of 2023 and is now becoming available to patients um, as we speak. Uh, this Just within the last month or so, patients have been started to treat commercially at uh, left centers around the United States with this device. All right. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, coming very soon, uh, we talked a lot last year about um, impressive data for tumor infiltrating lymphocytes or TIL cell therapy uh, for PD-1 refractory melanoma. This has been approved and is reimbursed in the Netherlands, and the, this is under consideration by the US FDA with the PDUFA date at the end of this month, February 24th. So really keep an eye out for this. This may be an option very soon for patients with PD-1 refractory melanoma and has shown considerable success and safety in these patients. All right, to wrap it up. So for adjuvant therapy for stage two and two, uh, 2B and 2C, there is a recurrent free uh, survival and dis distant metastasis free survival benefit for using anti PD 1 therapy. However, it's important to note that compared to stage three disease, the number needed to treat is significantly higher uh, to see benefit for patients than in stage three, but the risk of toxicity remains the same. So while this is FDA, avail uh, FDA approved and available to patients, we really need to think carefully about which patient should be getting treated um, uh, for stage 2B and 2C disease. And this was an area of great debate in our field this year. 
For stage three resected melanoma, the mRNA vaccine is an interesting new strategy. It is the first agent to show additional risk reduction for resected stage three melanoma compared to PD-1 alone. And the confirmatory phase three trial is ongoing now. In the advanced disease space, um, at the two-year mark, Nevorella is continuing to show benefit for progression-free survival and objective response rate compared to nivolumab alone. Um, and we see a sustained benefit beyond initial progression uh, for the patients who do progress. Um, increased data for liver-directed therapy for uveal melanoma and uh, till cell therapy is emerging as a good potential option for patients after progression on anti-PD-1. And with that, I'll wrap up and say thank you. I hope to see you again next year for our 2024 update. Hi, my name is John Hahn. I'm a medical oncologist working at the Netherlands Cancer Institute in Amsterdam. Here are my disclosures. Today, I will you, I'll give you my highlights of immunotherapy over 2023. And I have four subjects, neoadjuvant immunotherapy, adjuvant immunotherapy containing a neoadjuvant mRNA vaccine, TIL in mucosal melanoma, and CAR T cells in refractory cell cancer. Starting with neoadjuvant immunotherapy, in 2022, Dr. Patel from the MD Anderson presented at ESMO the, study, the results of the uh, SWOC 1801 study. In this study, patients with resectable stage 3B to 4 uh, melanoma were randomized to receive standard of care surgery followed by one year or 18 cycles of pembrolizumab. In the experimental arm, patients would receive three cycles of pembrolizumab prior to surgery, followed by 15 cycles of pembrolizumab after surgery. The primary endpoint was event-free survival. Here you see the kaplan meyer plots of the event-free survival showing a clear benefit for patients that were in, uh, enrolled in the new adjuvant containing uh, pembrolizumab arm with a hazard ratio of 0 0.58. In 2023, the results of the pathologic responses uh, in the patients treated with new adjuvant uh, pembrolizumab were uh, presented uh, at ESMO uh, 2023 by Dr. Patel. Of the 153 patients randomized to the new adjuvant arm, 135 underwent surgery. Of these, 105 uh, specimens were available for central pathologic response assessment. Patients that had a response, either a complete pathologic response, a near complete response, together we call that the major pathologic response, or a partial response, meaning that less than 50% um, of a uh, residual viable uh, uh, tumor left in a specimen, um, had a 24 months relapse survival uh, rate of around 88%. Patients that have no pathological response had a uh, 24 relapse survival of 70%. And here you see the corresponding couple of my uh, 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 curves. Neoadjuvant immunotherapy based th uh, uh, therapy was also presented for non small cell lung cancer in the Checkmate uh, 77. T study. This was presented at ESMO 2023 by Dr. Cascona from MD Anderson. She presented this data for patients with resectable stage 2A to 3B non small cell lung cancer. Patients were randomized to receive either the combination of chemotherapy, four cycles plus nivolumab, followed by surgery, followed by nivolumab for one year, or uh, four cycles of chemotherapy followed by surgery, followed by um, uh, control. Primary endpoint uh, was inventory survival by independent review. And here you see the primary endpoint uh, showing a clear benefit for patients that had received the neoadjuvant nivolumab plus adjuvant uh, nivolumab uh, uh, treatment um, with a hazard ratio of 0 0.58. It was statistically significant. Patients that had stage 3 disease appear to benefit much more 
from this uh, treatment compared to patients with stage two disease. Also, we're looking at the uh, pathological complete response and major pathological response. There was a clear benefit uh, for patients that were treated with the nivolumab plus chemotherapy uh, treatment compared to chemotherapy alone, as you can see here in these uh, 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 diagrams. The study was um, uh, uh, discussed by Dr. Uh, Garasino from the University of Chicago, where she compared the checkmate 816, uh, 816 to the checkmate 77T. In the checkmate 816, patients only received nivolumab plus chemotherapy compared to chemotherapy in the new adjuvant arm, so there was no adjuvant treatment. You can see that these curves look very similar to the curves that we see for the, for the checkmate 77T, although the hazard ratio for the latter study was better. It could very well be that uh, patients that have a, a partial, uh, let's say a, a, a complete pathological response or a major pathological response uh, do so well that they do not need, for instance, adjuvant uh, uh, nivolumab uh, treatment. This, of course, is important uh, to further personalize this, uh, this treatment. The last study I would like to mention is a neoadjuvant immunotherapy study in colon cancer. The neoadjuvant nivolumab plus lulatumab uh, uh, in locally advanced mismatch repair deficient colon cancers, the NIST 3 study. This was presented by Dr. Vashor from Dr. Shalabi's uh, group at NKI in Amsterdam. We know that mismatch repair deficiency is one of the best predictive biomarkers for immunotherapy response, but only occurs in 10 to 50 percent of non metastatic colon cancers. Last uh, uh, two years ago, we saw the results of NISH2, uh, where patients were treated new adjuvantly with uh, uh, one course of nivolumab plus ipilimab, uh, followed by one course of nivolumab alone. And here you see the uh, uh, waterfall plots with a 95% major pathologic response uh, and a 67% uh, uh, pathologic complete response. In this study, nivolumab plus relotumab, which we know may have a better and uh, safety profile uh, as was seen in melanoma, was uh, tested in this uh, setting. It's an investigative initiative non-randomized multicenter study um, where nivolumab plus relotumab is given um, um, twice with four weeks interval and surgery is performed in week eight. Primary endpoint is pathologic response rate. The study had a Simon stage two design, um, uh, and we now look at the results of the first 19 treated patients. And this is the pathologic response. 100% of patients had a pathological response. 79% had a pathologic complete response. And the waterfall plot is impressive. Adjuvant, immunothera uh, adjuvant chemotherapy uh, was not uh, given to any of these patients. The primary endpoint was met in this first stage. Um, uh, and therefore, more patients will be included in this trial. So to summarize the new adjuvant immunotherapy across cancers, we know that new adjuvant immunotherapy or IO-based therapies are showing consistent benefit in event-free survival compared to adjuvant therapies only or compared to chemotherapy. PCR and MPR are consistent in being a good surrogate marker of event-free survival and hopefully also overall survival. It remains important to personalize adjuvant treatment based on the pathologic response during new adjuvant immunotherapy. Now let's switch gears to an mRNA uh, vaccine. In this uh, study in patients with stage 3 melanoma, a biopsy was taken uh, from these uh, tumors and whole exome sequencing and RNA sequencing was performed to identify mutations in expressed genes. Around these mutations, epitopes were predicted that could bind to DHLA molecules of the patients, and all of these um, uh, potential epitopes were um, incorporated into the vaccine. Once the vaccine was uh, given to the patient, um, the mRNA would, uh, 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 would be translated to a protein, and upon degradation, peptides would bind to the HLA molecules and present that at the cell surface to the T cells that could be activated. In this uh, randomized controlled phase uh, two study uh, for patients with uh, uh, resectable stage three B, C, and uh, D, and and four, uh, patients following surgery were uh, uh, to receive in a two to one randomization either the combination of the mRNA vaccine plus pembrolizumab, or as a standard of care pembrolizumab only. The 
primary endpoint was relapse-free survival. More than 90% of the patients uh, screened had tissue of sufficient quality for mRNA uh, manufacturing, and uh, this was prepared for more than 99% of the patients in the combination arm. 91% of the patients in the combination arm had an, uh, a vaccine that incorporated 34 new antigens. These are the uh, primary endpoint results for lab free survival, showing a benefit for patients treated in the combination arm, so pembrolizumab, plus the uh, individualized mRNA vaccine compared to pembrolizumab alone. These are the results of a phase two study, uh, um, which is rather limited in, in, in number, and therefore a randomized controlled phase three uh, study was needed, and this study has just initiated, been initiated. Would like to switch gears to uh, to uh, treatment with tumor inflated lymphocytes. As you know, tumor inflated lymphocyte treatment is effective in patients with metastatic melanoma, either in really the advanced setting following uh, uh, all prior treatment lines, or as was shown in the randomized controlled phase three study, in patients that were refractory to either an adjuvant anti PD1 or adjuvant or anti PD1 in the uh, metastatic setting. In this study, uh, patients uh, with um, mucosal melanoma that were incorporated in um, uh, the life uh, studies um, were analyzed. So a sub-study of this uh, larger C14401 study. We know that patients with mucosal melanoma do worse on uh, checkpoint in, 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 uh, inhibition. So the question was whether TIL would function, would work in this patient population. TIL were given as a standard uh, following first tissue procurement uh, and uh, product and uh, manufacturing of the product, and then lymphodepleting chemotherapy, life loose cell infusion, and hydrous interleukin 2. When we look at the uh, baseline characteristics of these patients, um, all of these patients were refractory to anti PD1 based therapies. Uh, patients were uh, V600, uh, BRAF V600 wild time, and 40% had an elevated LDH. The median number of TIL infused was 26 billion and uh, the number of uh, IL-2 doses was 5.5. With a median follow-up of 35 months, the objective response rate was 50%, one patient with a complete response and five patients with a uh, partial response. And here to the right, you see the waterfall plot that is corresponding to that. Um, four of these six responders uh, were durable, lasting longer than 24 uh, months. In mucosal melanoma, um, which is a very different disease from cutaneous melanoma <clears throat> that is not written by UV radiation, there are very few um, mutations, and therefore the TMB uh, in mucosal melanoma is much lower compared to patients with cutaneous melanoma. Still, following infusion of TIL, you see that there is an expansion and contraction and, and also persistence of the cells that is very similar in patients that are treated with TIL. Uh, for mucosal melanoma compared to cutaneous melanoma. What we still recognize at the moment is not uh, clear. The last study I would like to mention is the BNT2111 uh, study, an interim uh, analysis from a repeat dose escalation study of clonal 6 CAR T cells now manufactured uh, with an automatic process, which was combined with the clonal 6 mRNA vaccine. <laughs> It's clear that uh, clotin-6 is an interesting target for CAR T cell therapy in solid cancers as it is not expressed in healthy tissue and can be re-expressed in various cancers like testicular cancer, ovarian cancer, and endometrial cancer. A clotin-6 uh, targeting CAR was generated, a second generation CAR um, uh, with high affinity and was combined with a clotin-6 mRNA uh, vaccine encoding full-length clotin-6, um, uh, which was formulated in laprosomes. Following intravenous infusion, uh, the CAR antigen would be uh, delivered to the antigen presenting cells and lymphoid uh, uh, tissues. And uh, uh, this was meant to drive the expansion of CAR T cells to uh, remain in optimal, optimal therapeutic window. Today, I present only the data of the uh, 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 phase one study performed with the automated uh, product. There were four uh, dose levels with monotherapy and three with the combination with the mRNA vaccine. And here you see the efficacy results uh, showing the best response uh, uh, in this waterfall plot. In green, patients with testicular cancer, 
in purple patients with ovarian cancer and in gray patients with other cancer types. We show here that there was a objective response rate of almost 45% in 44 patients uh, with a disease control rate of 73%. Uh, uh, when we just look at those patients treated with, in dose level one, so uh, 10 to the uh, eight cells, you can see that the results are even better. And we see quite a number of responses occurring in ovarian cancer patients. Now, the objective response rate was almost 60% um, and the disease control rate of 95%. You can also see in the spider plots that some of these responses deepened over time. Interestingly, uh, when we compare patients treated in dose level 2 with monotherapy and the combination with the mRNA vaccine, the expansion of the CAR T cells is very similar, but the persistence with the cells is improved by the presence, well, by the combination with the mRNA vaccine that is very similar to what was seen in the preclinical models. So to conclude, in 2023, there were, uh, I think, 11 new indications of immunotherapy for the treatment of cancer. Especially in the field of neoadjuvant IO-based therapies, there has been tremendous results uh, uh, presented. And for some cancers, this, already, this has already become a new standard of care, like in triple neck breast cancer, not much in lung cancer. But it's expected that and this will uh, occur in many more cancer types. Cell therapy are coming for solid cancers. Till in melanoma will probably be the first to be approved and hopefully very soon by the FDA, but I'm sure that also CAR T cells and T cell receptor gene modified cells will come for other, uh, other solid cancers. There are very interesting results also with T cell engagers, um, like for instance, the PRAME CD3 biospecific for solid cancers and the BCMA CD3 and CD20 B uh, CD3 uh, bites for patients for patient with hematologic malignancies. And then there were very uh, exciting results of the combination of an antibody drug conjugate uh, and fortumab venetin uh, combined with NTPD1 for patients with uh, metastatic urothelial cell cancer. Um, and I think this has already become a, a, a new, um, uh, eff highly efficacious standard of care. And with that, I've come to the end of my uh, highlights of 2023. I thank you very much for your attention and hopefully see you next year. Hello, my name is Ben Westphan. I'm a medical oncologist and molecular biologist by training, and I'm leading the precision oncology program at University of Munich. I'm super excited to take part in the 2023 OncoAlert Colloquium, and will give you a short ride through my personal highlights of targeted therapies in 2023. These are my conflicts of interest, none of which have influenced today's talk. So today I would like to talk to you about drugging the undruggable. It's about time we're seeing more and more KRAS inhibitors in clinical trials and entering clinical practice. Secondly, HER2. Are we talking about the next tissue agnostic biomarker here? Third, IDH1-2 inhibition, changing the trajectory for patients with low-grade glioma. And then, last but not least, going liquid, is our mutant breast cancer and its treatment based on liquid biopsies. So let's kick it off with drugging the undruggable. I remember vividly when I was a postdoc at Columbia University that I attended a meeting on pancreatic cancer. It must have been 2011 or 2012. And I was told by leaders in the field that we're never going to see drugs targeting mutant KRAS, which was especially devastating for me as a pancreatic cancer doc because KRAS mutations are almost uniformly present in this disease. So it's exciting that merely 10 years later, we're seeing a lot of different compounds in clinical trials and in the market. So why is it so important to talk about RAS mutant disease and RAS inhibitors? As you can see here, 
roughly three and a half million patients will be diagnosed with RAS mutant cancer each year. And as you can see down below, there are vast differences in between cancers with relation to the isoforms of mutant KRAS most present. As I will show you over the next couple of slides, G12C inhibitors or the first drugs to enter the market but the G12C isoform, as you can see here, is rather rare in the spectrum of RAS mutant cancers. So as mentioned before, it was really Sotorazib kicking it off in 2020 when the first publication in the New England Journal came out on Sotorazib in KRAS G12C mutant advanced solid tumors. I'm showing you the waterfall plot for non-small cell lung cancer here with an overall response rate of 32% and a disease control rate of 88%. In the beginning of 2023, we saw the G12C mutant pancreatic cancer cohort again presented in the New England Journal of Medicine. We saw an overall response rate of 21% and a disease control rate of 84%. With a median PFS of four months in a heavily pretreated population of patients, so Terazib showed promising signs of activity in this hard to treat disease. This will not change the trajectory of pancreatic cancer or G12C mutant pancreatic cancer in itself, yet it showed that mutant KRAS is targetable and then also that these drugs could sh show activity on their own, but more importantly serve as partners in combinational therapies. I was especially excited to see preliminary clinical activity of RMC6236 presented at ESMO 2023. RMC6236 is a first-in-class RAS-selective multi-on inhibitor, and it was tested in patients with KRAS mutant pancreatic cancer and non-small cell lung cancer. So RMC6236 is a novel compound which when entering the cell, binds to cyclophilin A, bi builds a binary complex, which then binds to mutant KRAS and then inhibits its function in the cell. So rather than just binding or trying to bind the mutant protein, it's chaperoned by another protein within the cell. I'm showing you data for G12X mutant pancreatic cancer, 46 patients presented here with an overall response rate again of 20% and a disease control rate of 87%. Median time to response in this population was 1.4 months and median time on treatment was 3.3 months. And at that time, it was most patients actually progressing and not due to toxicity issues. Looking at this swimmer's plot, minding it is shown in weeks, you can see that there are some patients who have prolonged benefit from this oral KRAS inhibitor. Next, I want to talk to you about HER2. And really, 2023 has been the year of HER2. And the question really is, are we talking about the next tissue agnostic biomarker? This slide just shows you a brief overview of a snapshot of the many high-ranking publications on targeting HER2 
across a variety of cancers that came out in 2023. I could have chosen any of these publications, but what I would want to highlight today really is the data of trastuzumab deruxtecan in patients with HER2 expressing solid tumors. These are the primary results from the Destiny Pantumor O2 trial published in the JCO by Fundamerik Bernstam and colleagues. And as you can see here, you have overall response rates up to 84% in endometrial cancers, but really good activity across a broad spectrum of cancers. We have an outlier here with pancreatic cancer where the response rates are low, but then looking at the swimmer's plots on the right-hand side of the slides, you see that some of the pancreatic cancer patients had long-lasting disease stabilization under trastuzumab deruxtecan. Looking at the other histologies included here, you see that some patients are on the drug for more than two years. So this is really an important step forward in the treatment of HER2 positive disease. It will be critical to understand now with all these treatment options, what the right sequence of HER2 targeting agents is in patients, for example, that are HER2 mutant um, and are also overexpressing. This will be work that will continue well into 2024 and 25 to understand which HER2 targeting agent is the best for any given patient. Although I'm not a neuro-oncologist, most probably one of the highlights of 2023 for me with the data on IDH1-2 inhibition in low-grade glioma. IDH1-2 mutations are very, very frequent, uh, up to 100% of cases with diffuse low-grade glioma carry an IDH1 or IDH2 mutation. So finding a targeted agent for these patients is really big. And presented in the New England Journal of Medicine by Ingo Mellinghoff and colleague, data on forasidinib in IDH1 or IDH2 mutant low-grade glioma. And as you can see here in this randomized phase 3 placebo-controlled clinical trial, forasidinib was superior to placebo with a hazard ratio for disease progression or death of 0.39 and a median progression-free survival of 27.7 months. Another very important patient-relevant outcome here was how long it took for patients to receive the next intervention while undergoing treatment within this clinical trial. In, in the placebo arm, it was roughly 18 months, and in the voracidinib arm, as you can see, this median has not been reached. Last but not least, going liquid, is R1 mutant breast cancer. Liquid biopsies have a large potential at almost every stage of the patient journey. You can use them in screening, you can monitor neoadjuvant treatment, you can monitor molecular residual disease after tumor-specific intervention and monitor for relapse. And then, of course, in more advanced disease, it can help to identify biomarkers to guide treatment and look at markers of resistance. And here we're talking about elacestrant versus standard endocrine therapy for estrogen receptor positive human 
epidemial growth factor or receptor to negative advanced breast cancer. And importantly here, ESR1 mutations were diagnosed using liquid biopsies. And as these ESR1 mutations are very volatile, so they appear and disappear, the monitoring of markers of resistance to standard endocrine therapy like fulvestrand will become critical in the end so that you know when these ESR1 mutations pop up, your drug of choice will be Alastrand in the end. With this, I would to like to wrap up and say a lot has happened in 2023. This is just a personal snapshot. I could have shown you the data of Copisco presented at ESMO 2023, the first randomized clinical trial in cancer of unknown primary applying targeted treatment and comprehensive genomic profiling. But today I would wanted to concentrate more on the targeted treatment side here. So we've seen large progress over the last couple of years in the treatment of RAS mutant cancers and there's a lot to come. I'm really looking forward to smart combinational therapies, maybe with immunotherapeutics. HER2, as I said, it was the year of HER2, is emerging as an even broader target than expected with multiple therapeutics showing activity of a broad range of cancers. We've seen significant progress in neuro-oncology with a targeted therapy in IDH1 mutant low-grade glioma. And liquid biopsy informed treatment of ESR1 mutant breast cancer. As a precision oncologist, especially in the last case, it's important because it shows that, that you can integrate innovative technologies into the management of care in prospective clinical trials. And this kind of evidence will be critical to broaden access to innovative diagnostic technologies for all of our patients. With this, I again want to thank Gil Morgan and Uncle Lord for inviting me to talk during the 2023 Uncle Lord Colloquium, and I'd be happy to answer your questions. <laughs>